For I'm a miracle. Jackie Robinson hits bias in Monster Meeting Talk. Secretary of State to speak for Monster Meeting at YMCA. Monster Meeting Series schedules Noted famous engineer persons. to speak for Martin Luther King y. like Moses. International singer to speak at Monster Young scientist on Monster Meeting. Educator Meetings. of international fame opens Monster Meeting. Governor Meetings. Schricker to address Monster Meeting at YMCA. Welcome to Talking Hoosier History, brought to you by the Indiana Historical Bureau. For over a century, we've been marking Hoosier history. Now it's time to start Talking Hoosier History. I'm Lindsay Beckley, and I'll be your host. Before we get to the topic on hand, I wanted to give a bit of a disclaimer. In this episode, as in most episodes, we'll be using quotes from early and mid-20th century newspapers. Some of the language in those excerpts concerning race, while widely used at the time, would not be acceptable today. In the interest of preserving the historical authenticity of these sources, we have left them unchanged and uncensored. But please know, we don't condone, nor would we use this language today. In the first half of the 19th century, young men flocked to the bustling metropolis of London, England in search of jobs in the growing industrial sector. While they found their ways into the factories, they also discovered the city's more unsavory gathering places, like brothels and taverns, and, one suspects, a decent amount of trouble. One London newcomer, George Williams, dreamed of a more wholesome gathering place for these young industrial workers, with the idea that, given a suitable alternative, they would steer clear of London's underbelly. In 1844, those ideas came to fruition with the establishment of the Young Men's Christian Association, otherwise known as the YMCA. By 1851, less than a decade later, the new association had spread around the world with chapters in Australia, France, Germany, Canada, and the United States. Two years later, a formerly enslaved man, Anthony Bowen, organized the first YMCA serving African-American men and boys in Washington, D.C. For nearly a century afterwards, the United States YMCA would promote, but not mandate, segregated facilities for its black and white members. White YMCA activities in central Indiana can be traced back as far as 1854. In the early years, up until the late 1880s, black men weren't officially barred from membership, as in, there was no rule on the books saying they weren't allowed, but none had actually tried to join, so the issue hadn't been raised. In 1888, two or three black men attempted to join the Indianapolis Y. When their applications were denied, the de facto segregation of the Indianapolis YMCA was brought into sharp focus, and it became clear that African Americans would not be welcomed in the association, whether there was an official rule or not. Oh, oh, John. Oh. In 1900, a group of African Americans formed a young men's prayer band in Indianapolis. Two years later, the band merged into, quote, a colored YMCA. The establishment of this YMCA provided facilities for those men who had been excluded from the central organization. In an Indiana Magazine of History article, Dr. Stanley Warren points out that, quote, the necessity of finding a way to survive within a limiting system driven by segregationist tendencies has been the base from which many great African-American traditions and organizations have begun. In the capital city, the organization then called the Indianapolis Colored YMCA is a shining example of this. Emerging due to the discriminatory practices of Indianapolis, this branch of the Y would become one of the largest and most influential black YMCAs in the country. Before that could happen, though, they needed a building able to accommodate their rapidly growing membership. By 1911, just nine years after its formation, the YMCA outgrew its building, located at California and North Streets in the city. To remedy this, they proposed the construction of a new building. The estimated building cost was $100,000, 
a figure that seemed unobtainable to many in the community, where even the working professionals were barely getting by due to the limited job opportunities available to them. Fortunately, just as the YMCA members began planning their fundraising strategy, they gained a rather unlikely ally in a white Jewish Chicago businessman. Julius Rosenwald, part owner of Sears Roebuck & Company, announced that he would give $25,000 to any community able to raise $75,000 towards the construction of a Colored Young Men's Christian Association building. With this motivation, the members of the Indianapolis Colored YMCA joined forces with the white members of the Central YMCA for what would become an incredible fundraising push. Two teams were formed, one for the white members and one for the black, and they set out on their mission. In just 10 days, the $75,000 goal was surpassed. On July 28, 1912, with a crowd of over 5,000 people in attendance, YMCA committeemen broke ground on the site of a new building. Three months later, another celebration with thousands of spectators was held for the laying of the cornerstone. Construction was completed on the building, located at the corner of Michigan Street and Senate Avenue in downtown Indianapolis in July 1913. YMCA members held a week of festivities and ceremonies in celebration of the opening of the new Senate Avenue Y, including a ladies' night, a fraternal night, and an athletic night. The highlight of the week, though, was Tuesday, July 8th, the official dedication, which featured an address by Booker T. Washington, civil rights activist and founder of the Tuskegee Institute. Pass it down, making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom you are surrounded. In his address, Washington commended the citizens of the city, both black and white, for banding together to make the Senate Avenue Y a reality. Then he said, I am proud of being a member of the Negro race and never more so than tonight. I spurn the men who sympathize with me because I am a member of the Negro race. We have work to do and difficulties to overcome. Let the white people know about the good deeds in our race. In too many cases, white people hear only of crime. They do not hear about the hardworking, industrious, sober, colored men. And Indianapolis has many of the latter class. In many cases, African-American churches were at the heart of the community. The Indianapolis Colored YMCA, itself a Christian organization, became another center of the African-American community in Indianapolis. The Y opened at the tail end of a major influx of African-Americans to the city following the Civil War and Reconstruction. In the 40 years between 1860 and 1900, the African-American population of Indianapolis grew 3,000 percent. White residents did not welcome these newcomers. Oftentimes, they were relegated to segregated areas of the city due to housing discrimination and exclusion from facilities. Indiana Avenue was at the center of the largest African-American community in the city, with 30,000 black residents living within a 10-mile radius of the avenue by the 1950s. Majority black neighborhoods such as this did not have access to the same social, recreational, and charitable organizations as the white communities. Because of these segregationist policies, black communities had long provided these things for themselves, often led by their churches. This is where the Senate Avenue Y stepped in, building on and expanding the work of African American churches. The Y was located in the heart of the Indiana Avenue African American community and offered adult education classes, held Bible studies, provided meeting spaces for a variety of organizations, and even established an amateur basketball team. These programs, according to historians, fostered self-respect and self-reliance and tried to provide young men with proper role models and male companionship. They served as sanctuaries, which preserved African-American masculinity and prepared black men and boys for their leadership role and the struggle for equality that lay ahead. In order to reach more and more young men and boys, 
the Y held annual membership drives. These campaigns borrowed military organizational structures, dividing members into divisions of enlisted men. These men worked hard to recruit as many new members as possible. Those groups that enlisted the most new members were inducted into the Society of High Producers and the Royal Order of Spencer Inktum, which I looked it up and it's a real word, meaning the will to succeed, which is rather fitting. These tactics worked fabulously. Membership jumped from just 52 in 1903 to over 5,000 by 1930. These wildly successful membership drives turned the Senate Avenue Y into one of the largest African-American YMCA branches in the country. But being large doesn't necessarily make an organization important or influential. To understand the influence of the Y, we need to go right back to the very beginning of the branch, to the establishment of what were called monster meetings. The roots of what would become the Senate Avenue YMCA monster meetings can be traced to the very early days of the Indianapolis Colored YMCA and Executive Secretary Thomas Taylor. He instituted public forums where first men, and later all people, would gather on Sunday afternoons between November and March to listen to lectures on a wide variety of topics. Originally, Taylor wanted to call the forums big meetings, but the proposal was rejected by the Central YMCA Board because their annual meeting was already called the Big Meeting. So, Taylor won up them and labeled his forum series the Monster Meetings. Taylor couldn't have known just how fitting that name would become. In the Taylor years, the meetings featured local religious leaders speaking almost exclusively on religious matters, but in 1916, a new executive secretary took the meetings to a whole new level. That executive secretary was Fabrin de France. Longtime listeners of the podcast may remember from our first episode that de France led the campaign against the segregation of the Indiana University men's basketball team in the 1940s. In 1916, he had been in Indianapolis for just three years and advanced to the top position of the Senate Avenue YMCA with ambitious goals. During de France's tenure, monster meetings continued to feature local ministers delivering religious messages, but they soon expanded to include some of the most well-known African-American leaders of the nation, speaking on a variety of hot-button issues. In his seminal article, The Monster Meetings at the Negro YMCA in Indianapolis, Dr. Stanley Warren provides a list that sampled a few of the hundreds of speakers and topics featured at monster meetings during the de France years. When reading this list, the thing that initially jumped out at me was the variety of speakers included. There were authors, NAACP leaders, professors, university presidents, politicians, newspapermen, famous athletes, religious leaders, and a former first lady. When analyzing the list a bit further, I started to notice trends. You can see history unfolding before you just in the titles of the lectures. In early 1930, at the very beginning of the Great Depression, Freeman Ransom gave a lecture on unemployment, unemployment and, how, and to how to solve it. In 1931, 11 years into America's great experiment of prohibition, Reverend Charles H. Winders and Boyd Gurley debated the question, Prohibition, shall Indiana stay dry? In 1940, as World War II raged in Europe, Dr. Max Jurgen spoke on, Democracy, a goal to defend. And after U.S. entry into World War II, Dr. Lorenzo Green spoke on The Negro in National Defense. A. Philip Randolph lectured on The Negro in War and Peace. And William Hasty talked on The Fight Against Discrimination in the Armed Forces. Then, in the post-war era, The Colonies in the Post-War World by Frida Neugebauer and Implications of the Atomic Bomb by Mordecai Johnson. In 1947, one year after the Frable School Board in Gary, Indiana, voted for desegregation after hundreds of white students staged a walkout in protest of integration, Joseph Chapman spoke on Democracy in Gary Schools. 
Leading up to and during the civil rights movement, speeches such as this is the hour, integrated society or a segregated society, and the civil rights crisis and American democracy, and the civil rights resolution in America, demonstrate that the black citizens of Indianapolis were having the same discussions and debates as the black citizens around the nation. Unfortunately, there's no collection or archive of the speeches given at these monster meetings. At least not that I've been able to locate. Luckily, preserved in the pages of newspapers like the Indianapolis Recorder, there are snippets of some of the lectures, and there was no way we could do a podcast about monster meetings and not include the words of the leaders who spoke at those meetings. Now, let's reach back into the pages of the Recorder and hear from a few of the powerful speakers that have graced the stage of the Senate Avenue YMCA monster meetings. Dr. Mordecai Johnson was a fixture of the monster meeting schedule, opening the meeting season for over 40 consecutive years. He became involved with the YMCA in 1916, when he served as a student secretary and was a lifelong supporter of the association. Dr. Johnson became the first African-American president of Howard University, one of the nation's historically black universities, in 1926. He served in that capacity until 1960. During his decades speaking at the monster meetings, he covered a wide range of topics, including anti-Semitism anti and, and the, the Negro, Negro ministry, civilizations, civil war, freedom's challenge, implications of the atomic bomb, Gandhi and the liberation of India, a troubled world in the Middle East, and segregation is suicide. Described as a man who, quote, made people listen even when they did not believe, Johnson was a powerful speaker and lent his skills to important topics. For example, as Cold War tensions mounted, he spoke of the dangers American segregation posed to the nation. He said, Through our nation's moral weakness caused by segregation, we are committing scientific and technical suicide. We are five years behind military, due to this moral weakness. Oh, my brothers, let us pray it is not too late. Only Almighty God knows whether it is not too late already. He went on to address the recent affirmation of Brown versus Board of Education, seen in the 1957 integration of Central High School in Little Rock. It is my judgment that the death knell of segregation has been sounded. I see no disposition on the part of the Supreme Court to yield to the opponents of integration. The court is informed by a sense of world duty which is inexorable. Another name which appears more than once on the list of prominent figures featured at monster meetings is that of A. Philip Randolph. I will march and I will write letters. I will demonstrate and I will vote. I will work to make sure that my voice and those of my brothers ring clear and determined from every corner of our land. In 1925, Randolph organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was the first labor union comprised principally of African-American workers. He was a major civil rights activist and played a large part in pressuring President Franklin Roosevelt to issue an executive order that banned discrimination in World War II defense industries. He also pressured President Harry Truman to issue an executive order to end segregation in the armed forces. Randolph wasn't satisfied with those successes, though. In 1955, he stood in the Senate Avenue YMCA and declared, Negroes are yet second-class citizens. Civil revolution was never completed. Free public schools were never established. Negroes cannot buy property where they wish, nor can they enter certain businesses. They cannot join all the various unions. The Negroes cannot vote in some parts of this country, therefore they are not yet free. Later, in 1963, Randolph organized the March on Washington. Rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. Where Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. This nation will rise up and 
live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. A speech which highlighted the injustice of many of the same racist, segregationist policies Randolph underscored in his Monster Meeting lecture. In 1958, Martin Luther King Jr. himself, possibly the most widely recognized name of the Civil Rights Movement, also made an appearance on the YMCA Monster Meeting roster. Due to high interest in King's lecture, the venue was moved to Cato Tabernacle to accommodate the larger audience. In one of his first public appearances since he suffered a brutal attack, the Baptist minister kept his message of nonviolence, urging the use of love in the face of violence. A new age of justice is challenging us to love our oppressors. We must not assume this new freedom with attitudes of bitterness and recrimination for if we do, the new age will be nothing but a duplicate of the old one. A new world is being born, and the old world will die. We must be prepared for the new world to come. Segregation is nothing but slavery covered up with certain niceties and complexities. If democracy is to live, segregation must die. He went on saying, Use love. Love is a sure winner. Remember that as Christians, we are working with God. If we do it the way God wants us to do it, we will be able to sing with pride, my country tis of thee, for freedom must ring from every mountainside. The Senate Avenue YMCA Monster Meetings played a central role in not only educating members about topics of local, national, and international importance, but also in galvanizing the community into action. According to Dr. Warren, quote, As the popularity and importance of these mass education meetings grew, both the public and YMCA members exhibited a higher level of community activism. For I'm America. For those who regularly attended monster meetings, the YMCA became a foundation for the changes that they worked towards in the coming decades. The meetings were a place where, in the words of Dr. Mordecai Johnson, The red cap and the lawyer, the laborer and the doctor, seek together to find answers to social and political questions. Once again, I'm Lindsay Beckley, and this has been Talking Hoosier History. If you're interested in learning more about the Senate Avenue YMCA or Monster Meetings, check out Dr. Stanley Warren's book, The Senate Avenue YMCA for African American Men and Boys. A special thanks this episode to Dr. Frank Thomas, the voice of civil rights leaders quoted in this episode. Thomas is the director of the Ph.D. program in African American Preaching and Sacred Rhetoric at the Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. And thanks to Justin Clark, the voice of all newspapers here on Talking Hoosier History. And as always, thanks to Jill Weiss, our sound engineer extraordinaire, for bringing our words to life. Stay connected by liking us on Facebook or following us at at Talk Hoosier Hist on Twitter. And if you like what you hear, subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.